Okay, so good morning to everybody. Welcome to the session. My name is Gerd Müller. I'm chairing this session. I have the pleasure to introduce as our first speaker, Miriam Otiaga. Uh, she's working for Samsung Electronics, and she will explain to us how the voice assistant works. Um, and thank you for having me here and to everyone attending. Um, yeah, I am Miriam Otera. I work for Samsung Electronics in Germany. So uh, I, I am a product manager of Bixby in German. And today I'm going to explain you the, the basic infrastructure of Bixby, why is it organized the way it, it is organized, and uh, then I will go deeper in the core technologies as it involves and how uh, a voice assistant actually works and what uh, technologies does it, it engages. So um, I've been working in human computer interaction, let's put it that way, for quite some time now and uh, it has been always clear that uh, natural language is like the holy grail of human computer interaction. But for years and years, this was not possible because the technologies that you need for it to work were not available or not ripe enough. And we are in a point of time in time where actually the technologies now are starting to be available, are good enough. We are still working on that, but uh, they are workable at least and usable. And currently, actually, one in Every five people is using a voice assistant to time, uh, to, to time how to boil an egg or to cook, for example. So the technology is already creeping into our lives. And that is um, the, the bet that Samsung has made. Samsung has seen that this is a new interface that with a huge potential in the, in the future and we are launching Bixby in five different languages across Europe, about just in Europe, uh, in five languages, plus Chinese and Korean and so on, and further languages all over the world. So Bixby's infrastructure is quite simple uh, to picture, not that um, easy to develop, but it's basically um, a cloud-based system. So Bixby is in the cloud and the different devices are connected to the cloud. So we don't have to develop a different voice assistant for every each, own, each device type, let's say a mobile phone or a fridge or a, t or, um, or a TV. We basically be, uh, develop the clients for different devices and those devices are connected to the cloud who, which is the one doing the, the language processing. So what we get from it is that um, all different devices are connected with one another, and then the capsules, others call it skills or goals, uh, the capsules that are developed for Bixby are overnight available for different uh, devices. So that's the theory behind. Yeah. So in order to do that, in order to build each and every one of the capsules, we just need a client for the different devices. Um, a big speak capsule, which actually does the language processing, and then an API to a third party from which we uh, extract the information. Because Bixby belongs to Samsung, but we don't have all the information in the world. We need third parties to supply us with information of every kind. So that way, currently, we have more than 30 native uh, services already integrated, things like camera or phone, you can access by voice in your mobile phone. Um, but also, we have third-party devices, the third-party capsules, sorry, that we are integrating um, non-stop to the system. And since the integration is so deep, we don't use these patch names. These patch names are uh, hi, Bixby, tell Deutsche Bahn when the ne next train is coming or something like that. You just say, hey, Bixby, when is the next train coming? And Bixby is smart enough to map it to the provider that should give that information. So in theory, this is very nice, but how does actually voice integration work? 
I am um, a linguist by training, and even if linguists have been uh, studying language for years and years and decades, no one actually knows how, how we speak, and, uh, and no one definitely knows how we learn. So how do we teach a machine to speak when we don't know ourselves how we learn? But anyway, we can all agree that voice interaction doesn't matter if it's computer-based or human, um, has the following pillars. <laughs> First, we need to hear or listen, uh, which would be transcribing a sound wave into written form or to language, let's say. Uh, then we have to understand it. Notice here that hearing and understanding are not the same thing. I can listen to Chinese, but I will not understand a word. But actually knowing the language in place, understanding, extracting the meaning out of it. Then we have to prepare an answer to it, to the query that we got. And then in the end, we have to utter the response. So that would be like the pillars of voice interaction, of human voice interaction. And for, for machines, for, hum, for human computer interaction, we have followed the exact same path. So for hearing, we have um, automatic speech recognition. For understanding, we have natural language understanding modules. Uh, for producing the language, we have natural language generation, even if that can be discussed if it's considered that generation or not. And for speaking, we call text-to-speech or speech synthesis. Now I will go, I will walk you through uh, the different technologies one by one. So for automatic speech recognition, the goal is to transcribe a sound wave into written words. And here the biggest challenge is language variability. It's considered that a single human being does not utter the same vowel, vowel twice in a lifetime. So even if we always hear the same vowel, there are always small glitches in different frequencies that make the actual sound wave, like the, the physical um, sound, a bit different. So we have to teach the system to be able to map each sound to each letter, let's say. How do we do that? Well. First, we start by uh, defining a, an alphabet, a phonetic alphabet. Uh, this, is, this is the one for German. And so by defining an alphabet, we are saying to the system, hey, everything you will hear, you will use uh, this set of phonemes to transcribe. So this is a closed set. And together with it, we feed the system with phonetically transcribed audio corpora. What this does is, uh, it's just sound files, conversations, monologues, whatever, that are already transcribed. So the system can actually map the different sounds to the different phonemes. That, in, that allows the system to build an image of every sound, because as I mentioned before, the sounds may, sound, may be very different, depending on the context. But of course, if we only had uh, an alphabet, and, and audio data, we will get with one of those phonetic transcriptions that linguists love, but a human, normal human beings don't. <laughs> so together with that, we have to feed the system with text corpora, uh, chopped into engrams. So what are engrams? Engrams are uh, basically uh, strings of words. Um, a, string, a string of two words is called a bigram, a string of three words is called a three gram, and so on and so forth. We, usually we work with up to five grams. So we take a huge, huge written corpus, we, chopped it, we chop it into different engrams, and we process, this, process it to get a language model, so like a statistical image of the language. That allows us uh, not only to see the probability of appearance of each engram, but also to calculate the probability of a word to appear given the previous word, for example. Uh, this may sound a bit abstract, but what it allows is to basically teach the system grammatical rules without actually explaining them. For example, imagine we have such a um, phonetic transcription, which I love, but many people can't read. So the system starts to, 
we, now we have to um, transcribe it into words and chop the words, because chopping the words is not an easy thing. So you remember when you were children, and uh, I, I remember I used to write everything together. I could not chop the words. I, don't, I didn't know when, when a word ended and the next started, so I would write everything together. So for a machine, it's kind of the same thing. And uh, we have to teach it to actually chop the words. So a vowel followed by an African in the beginning of the sentence, chances are is where the word ish. Oh, this is in German, sorry. <laughs> so an ish followed by an aspirant vowel, uh, the P, what it would be. Let's go with have been. Okay, it's a, this is trial. But the system says that haben followed by each is very, very unlikely. So then it tries with another word, which is habe, and then the, the probability is much, much higher to be, for it to be correct. So we go with that one. And so on and so forth until uh, the sentence is transcribed. That's how we've gone from an actually sound wave into a written sentence. <coughs> But of course, uh, now we have to extract, extract uh, meaning out of it. And for extraction, uh, we use the natural language understanding module that is uh, Samsung proprietary. It's, it was built for Bixby ex exclusively, and it basically um, is built with the following pillars, code and training. Capsules are coded in JavaScript, and then a bunch of training is also needed. So in the code, uh, we define very precisely what each capsule is going to do, what its intention is, and what kind of sentences it should look for. And in the sentences, we also have to define the parameters we are looking for. So imagine we have a, a capsule that uh, is designed to look for shoes, shoes of different prices. So then we have to define um, intention, find shoe, and then define the parameters. We may have available like price, so find me a shoe between 50 and 100 euros, or each third party can decide which parameters they want to, to use. And then um, you need to provide example of sentences, basically, uh, that match the given parameters. And once you, once you map in the, in the example, in the training sentences, the parameters you are going to use, the system, which is a run, um, random forest algorithm, builds a language model that allows um, XP to redirect the sentences that match that code and that training to the capsule that was trained for it. So, um, yeah, we basically extract um, uh, the intention of the of the sentences by previously describing and, and defining very very exactly um, what the parameters we are looking for. So now we have extracted that information. The third party provides the information that is needed, which could be, for example, a list of shoes, and then we give it to the user. But of course, uh, to give it to the user don't only need a list of, of inputs, we also have to provide you know, a conversation-like feeling to the user. So Bixby needs to answer as well to the user. For that, um, we basically use um, sentences with slots. I have to say voice assistants currently are not proactive, which is a um, product management decision. Productive meaning if you don't talk to the assistant, the assistant is not going to talk to you. That's it. It could be annoying. I mean, that is a decision. Other people may want something proactive. Like if you saw the movie Her, everything, everyone imagines a voice assistant to be like that. We personally think it is annoying. <laughs> it could be annoying. But also, um, language generation is not researched well enough currently to be able to actually do that. Uh, so we work with scripted conversations. And we have uh, sentences where we have different slots that, where we change the information to fit every situation. For example, 
if I say something like, uh, it's warm in here, um, in some, and the intention is mapped to, okay, the user wants to switch the air conditioning on, because we will say something like, okay, I will turn the AC on. While uh, if I say, I'm freezing now, we will use this exactly same pattern of the sentence and change the slot that was assigned for it. So it would be, okay, I will turn the AC, air conditioning down. This is much, much easier than actually building the whole grammar of the sentences and allowing the system to say anything. So now we have the, uh, our, our sentence, let's say, um, uh, all built. And now we have to actually utter it. We can't only show everything on screen because it might be that we don't have a screen or the user is not looking at the screen. In the example of the shoes, sometimes we do show the, sh um, the product the user is looking for on the screen, but we don't have to. For example, in this case, where the user wants to turn the air conditioning on or off, um, we would actually execute the action and give a spoken feedback. So for speaking it out, we use uh, text-to-speech. And here, the same as in automatic speech recognition, the biggest, biggest challenge is the language variability. Um, in order, to sound, in order to, to sound natural, a synthetic voice needs to have many, 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 many samples of the same vowel, of the same consonant in different contexts. So, um, for example, look at these two sentences. It's, it's the same sentence, one in declarative form and one in um, interrogative form, but only because of the prosody of the, of the sentence, the, the vowels in the beginning of the sentence, uh, in the first one and in the second one, are, ex are, are totally different. So, we built a huge, huge corpus that was recorded for six months in a recording studio by a professional actor to actually have enough samples to cover any word in German. Um, we basically built a huge, huge, huge library of uh, sounds. But, of course, we don't record the sounds alone. We record the whole sentences and then we chop the sentences that were recorded. And then basically when we want to give the user a response, we have the written sentence and we fetch the different chunks of sound that we need in, in each case. So the solution is to build a huge oral corpus. Um, there are other methods um, to, for building TTS systems with, with way less um, recorded sentences, because recording is, is very expensive. You need a professional setting, professional um, actor or voice talent. And that is very ex expensive, but if you, are bu if you are building a voice assistant for the general public, the voice needs to be perfect or almost perfect. Otherwise, you get tired of it, and no one actually uses it anymore. Uh, we are very, very uh, proud of the Bixby voice in, in German. I'm only talking about the German system here uh, because it sounds very, very natural and soothing. That's very important. Um, like the, the, in America, they have three voices. One of them was brought down because it was too, the tone was too high. And it's nice if you hear it for 10 seconds, but over and over again, every day, people just started not to use it, just not to hear it. So it has to, you have to really find the, good, the best tone possible. So great, all these technologies are great, but what do you do with it? So how do you, where do I play with all this cool stuff? So if you go to the website xpdevelopers.com, you will find um, all the information related to Bixby there, you will be able to download the SDK and actually start coding the, uh, the capsules that you may want to build. For actually deploying the capsules, the, the system is not fully ready yet. You would have to contact um, Samsung Electronics 
first to actually upload this and upload the capsules right now because the marketplace is currently being built. But we are expecting for it to be working in months time. So that is everything uh, I had prepared. Feel free to ask any question you may have. Thank you. Yeah, the, and indeed they are cascading. <laughs> yes, so it depends on where the actually, actually the error happens. If it's an ASR error, if it's not well recognized, it's in the very beginning of the process. So it cascades down. It's basically, if there has been an ASR error, Bixby does not understand it. So we are not able to map it into the intended goal. Um, the ASR, though, is one of the oldest technologies I presented, so we are over 98% accuracy. So ASR in itself, it's currently not a problem. Usually the problem um, goes in natural language understanding. And the biggest problem is that when we are coding capsules, we code them in a very like defined way, but there is so much we're leaving out that Bixby or any other assistants, they don't know what to do with it. And usually they respond, I haven't found anything related to that or something like that. Or we try to give a graceful response so it's not that frustrating for the user. But yeah, basically, it depends on where the error has occurred. If ASR has recognized something that could be linked to other capsule, um, then the there is a mismatch of um, intention and then it lands in a different goal, which is the, maybe the worst case scenario. Yeah. But those are very, very, very few cases. For ASR, you mean, or for, yes, the ASR feedback, we do, since the accuracy is quite high, we can fairly easily, fairly automatically hold, like, uh, withdraw all the instances where the ASR failed or we suspect it failed. So those are, those go to the pipeline because and then are activated for ASR because we have the sound waves as well. So if the sound wave does not match, then of course a human being has come, has to listen to it and say, actually, this was a mismatch of ASR. But as I said, this is, the accuracy is so high currently that uh, this is one of the few cases. Yeah. So instead of cloning, I don't know, models, why do you not cloning words and then, for instance, use some word to back or some deep cloning technologies to understand what exactly the, um, the sequence or n-gram user wanted? Because I, I, I really think it's like a really limited subset. You don't talk to your device with, uh, you know, Shakespeare's uh, citation and all that stuff. So yeah. that's the question. And 
Maybe the second question just now. Uh, in your NL2 system, in understanding, do you have models for every language you support, or you translate it to English and then understand in English? No, we have to, yeah. so let me answer the second one first because it's very easy. No, you have to build a new model for each language from scratch. And uh, for ASR, it's funny you say, why don't you start by understanding the words? Sound waves are not words. Word is an invention that linguists have said to design a string of characters between two blanks. So word is an abstract concept that we have created. A sound, actually language is just phonemes, one after the other. So that is what we have to recognize, not words. First we have to recognize the phonemes and then chop it into words, which is different, uh, with a phoneme to graphing procedure. We do, I mean, here I gave a very simplistic overview of how ASR works. We do use deep learning stuff to make the model much, much more stronger. But you have to start with the phoneme recognition because that is what sound waves are and that is the minimal unit of language. Yeah. yeah. So, and the way you do this uh, in device, you have a model already in your device where you transfer all raw... Uh, Everything is in the cloud. Server. Everything is in the cloud. It's not in the device. So that is big Swiss approach. Uh, that is why our latency might be a bit uh, slower than in others. We, our threshold, our KPI is to have two seconds maximum end-to-end -end response. So in two seconds we have to recognize, uh, do the math, extract the, the, the answer and show it to the user. But ASA is actually taking into account that once you start once the word, first word is recognized, the second word, the set of possible second set of words is actually much, much lower. So it's easier to go, as, as you speak, it's easier to actually match which word you're going to say. So the hardest one usually is the first word. <laughs> And then, of course, the domain. Um, you are absolutely right. We don't have to understand Shakespeare. Here, uh, we have a language model where different domains that we are focused on are boosted. So automatically and, and statistically, we boost some domains of words. So they have a higher value than their representative of what the text analysis has given. So the boosting process is one of the key ones <laughs> for the ASR to work perfectly. Yeah. In different languages, you have different structures of the sentences. So when yeah. you're discussing, is German not really difficult? German is difficult because, because it has long distance agreements. And that's the problem of working with engrams. And here you see that natural language processing technologies have actually been developed for English, where words, uh, they, don't have, they don't rely on grammar, they just, it's just tokens one after the other, and the construction of the sentence is very, very strong, and it's always the same. In German, the verb might go to the end, so it's when you are working with engrams and token-based technologies, it's very hard to map words that, uh, words that are placed in the end but are influenced by a word that is in the beginning. Yeah. And that would, we are struggling with that. That's why boosting um, is one of the most loved strategies currently, because then um, we can say, okay, the probability of those words to appear is higher if the, in the beginning we have that word and so on. Well, I guess we have to move on, so thank you again.